Hi guys, welcome to the Sunday live stream. I'm in a Google Hangout today, hanging out by myself because I wanna be able to share with you some of the things that we're gonna talk about today so that you have a visual to go with just my beautiful voice, right? <laughs> um, so happy Memorial Day, everyone. What are you doing this weekend? How are you? Are you online? That's the question. Or are you out at the beach? What are you doing? Uh, let me know in the comments in the live chat. I'm going to open that chat up and welcome to 3,000 subscribers. I'm not a singer, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wanted to uh, shout out to all the new 3,000 subscribers that we have now. Hi, Trader Walt. Hi, Ahmed. Yeah, well, hold on. Let me just reflect on this for a second. 3,000 people want to know about how to travel more, how to live a life of freedom, how to work remotely, or just want to follow my crazy travels. Time will tell. We don't know for sure. But um, thank you and welcome. And if you're new here, I'm Kristen, and I've been traveling for a really long time. I was thinking this morning in yoga that it's, yeah, it's been about half of my lifetime. And ironically, I'll share my screen. Can I share my screen with one person? Yes, I can. Yesterday was my brother's birthday. So here we go. Let's share it. Can everybody see? Present to everyone. Yesterday was my brother's birthday. Um, so I was out looking for photos. Let me make this bigger. Uh, yeah, I was going back through the archives. There we go. Let's fill the screen up. Looking for photos. So I um, I was looking through old photo albums and look at this photo. This is me in 2000, the year 2000 as a freshman at the University of Central Florida. And look at this dinosaur of a computer. <laughs> Um, I'm on a cordless phone, as you can see here. I have an inkjet printer, and I have my very first HP desktop computer. OMG, I wrote kids these days will never know the struggle. Somebody said nice flat screen. <laughs> Let's see that zip disk drive. How fast was your modem? And yeah, I found this photo. And then I also found this one from the same year of, of me climbing a palm tree in Puerto Rico. And I just wanted to share that with you guys, take a walk down memory, memory lane, because for those of you who are new and you don't, maybe you don't know me that well yet, but this is basically me. So what I noticed in looking back at old photos, and I think that you will experience this if you do the same thing, is that when you look at yourself or your siblings or your parents or whoever it is, friends in old pictures, you'll notice that we're kind of born with our personality. Like we were all doing the same things as a little kid as we are doing now. Like I found photos of my brother um, making faces in every picture since he was like one year old or two years old through today, basically. Um, pictures of him at like nine years old reading a a manual on how to use his Canon camera. And today he is a speaker for Canon USA and he's a photo editor and a photographer and a videographer. And he is like just turned 34. So yeah, um, <laughs> apparently I've been traveling and working too much, no matter what the equipment was and no matter like what computer I had and documenting it, no matter what camera I had, like this photo, I think it came off of one of those little digital cameras, the one of me climbing the palm tree. So that was 19 years ago. So some things never change. The good news is that now we have YouTube and things so I can like share stuff. So if you're new, then that's me in a nutshell. Um, and also shout out to the old men who wrote the Digital Nomad book in 1997 for having the foresight to 
predict what was going to happen today with people working on their computers and traveling around the world because in 1997 I didn't even have a computer yet so yeah I'm just very impressed with those guys I don't think I have that book with me right now or I would show it to you but anyway so there's that um, follow me on traveling with Kristen if you want on Instagram so thanks to the new subscribers. Thank you to the winner of a signed copy of my new book, Digital Nomad 101, and it's going to Giselle. Because last week on the live stream, I said whoever wrote a review and screenshotted it and sent it to me would get into the mix for a free copy of my book. And I think that was somebody's idea in the stream. Whose idea was that? I forgot now. <laughs> um, so her review is amazing podcast, amazing host. So this is for badass digital nomads in the iTunes store. She says, I personally met Kristen at the Digital Nomad Summit in Las Vegas in 2018. She was one of the speakers and she is an amazing and professional digital nomad who's been living this lifestyle for 20 plus years, almost like 15. So there's no one better to host a podcast and interview show with the most badass digital nomads out there. Thank you, Giselle, for your review. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you like the book that I've been slaving away over for like the last every single day of this year, basically, except for when I was snowboarding in the French Alps. But other than that, every single day I've been working on it. Um, so that's coming at you hopefully fucking soon because it's taking forever. Uh, thank you to Trader Walt, who also subscribed to the podcast. And he's a Google person, so he couldn't leave a review. But thanks, Walt, for that. And anyone else who I'm missing who left a review and I haven't seen it yet or subscribed to the podcast, um, I don't know if the numbers are good or not yet, but like, a few hundred people have downloaded it. So I think that's good in the first week. Um, and they're just going to get better and better. Like I'm starting to foresee group badass digital nomad podcasts. I talked to two famous badass digital nomads today on Instagram and I pitched them a group live stream and podcast to talk about how they created their online businesses, how they, have managed traveling and working online and how they stay healthy on the road. So, wow, there's just so much coming up. I'm excited. Um, also, shout out to all my Patreon patrons. Let me read you guys' these names. Um, it's Tanner, Walt, Tech Lords, Ahmed. Go to my Jivco. Margaret, Darren, anyone else in there? I think that's all we have right now. <laughs> Thank you guys. Shout out. If you want to support, go to Patreon, patreon.com slash traveling with Kristen. And what else do I have for announcements? Um, tomorrow, hopefully, is the follow-up, so the sequel to the Tokyo, Kyo, sorry, the Kyoto Japan vlog part one. So today or last week on the, um, on traveling with Kristen, I posted my first travel vlog that I've had in a while and it is the Kyoto vlog part one. So that seems to be well received. It looks like people liked it and that was really fun to make. So I hope that part two is ready for tomorrow. If not, then you'll get part two of the Estonia vlog, which was the haunted house vlog. So either way, it's gonna be part two of a vlog. I just don't know which one yet because the other Kyoto one's not done. So depending on what happens today, we'll have to wait and see. Otherwise it will be next week. And also, we have on Badass Digital Nomads, last week I had Krista Romano, who is gorgeous and smart, and she is Christabella Travels on Instagram. So I'll show you. If you missed that, it is on 
traveling with Kristen on the Badass Digital Nomads playlist. And this is her on Instagram. And we did a live stream that was like an hour and 15 minutes long. And we talked about all sorts of things, traveling by yourself as a woman. I know that a lot of you are men, but that's okay. It's still good travel tips. Her favorite destinations in the world. We had Walt and Tech Lords and some other people asking questions, Cinnamon Travels. Um, and she's living in Lisbon. So the live stream was from Lisbon and it was really cool. So there we go. Can you guys see that? I hope that worked. Yeah, you can see it. Okay, cool. Um, so her interview is on Digital Nomad TV, which is youtube.com slash digital nomad. And it's also on the playlist here on Traveling with Kristen. And then this week, we're having uh, the, the founder of Nomad X. So ironically, it's a company that provides housing for digital nomads in Lisbon. That was a total coincidence that we have two Lisbon people back to back weeks in a row. So his name is Dave and he has digital nomad apartments, co-living and rooms for rent from one to six months. So it's affordable, great housing for digital nomads. And he's gonna be on Badass Digital Nomads on Tuesday. So definitely make sure you're around for that. Okay, Mas, what else? <laughs> I, was, uh, I was writing down, I've gotten requests for more stories. So last night I spent a couple hours just typing out every single travel story that I can remember. So that was interesting. It's a good preparation for the travel memoir um, writing workshop coming up in Paris in two weeks. So if you have any travel story requests or country requests, maybe I can make one of them into a video or something like that. That could be fun. And really looking forward to going to Paris soon, um, interviewing Rolf Potts, the author of Vagabonding on Badass Digital Nomads. I think we're going to do maybe Maybe we'll do the live stream here on Traveling with Kristen. I don't know yet, but all I know is that Rolf Potts said he could come on the podcast. So that's going to be outstanding. And what else? There's so much stuff. <laughs> There's so, what else happened this week? Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, that's all I can think of right now. Let's head over to the chat. Trader Walt says, yo. Oh, I need to go into the chat, live chat, live chat. Sam McDonald, what's up? Ahmed says, hello, beautiful Kristen. <laughs> Walt is making on and making fun of my old computer. I'm sure Tech Lords is too. It looks like I'm holding on for dear life. Well, that what really was funny about that is that computer did have a floppy disk drive and this cordless phone the white plastic cordless phone is what i really liked wait why can i not see the chat it won't scroll let me re reload when in doubt restart right Hey, Alex. He says, do you draw strength from your family? Uh, probably. I think that everybody, whoops, there goes the chat. Well, from looking at these old photos, I mean, I think we're a combination of genetics, obviously. And I think that our personality traits and characteristics are pretty fixed at birth. We're also a product of our environment, of course. but. I think a lot of what happens when you're born, when it comes to health and your like personality and stuff, a lot of it, I think, is genetic. Do you guys agree with that? I mean, the science, I think, shows both. I think it shows that you're part, you know, how you are when, when you're born and then you're part a product of what you eat, what you think, what you're surrounded with, whether it's people or your environment. That definitely can affect you. 
that's down. It's a big rabbit hole that we would go down. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think so. But I think strength, and and this is one of the things I wanted to talk about today. Why I put the title as mindset. So we're in the second week of the Digital Nomad Challenge, which is my first online program, and it's to help people get started with working remotely. And it's a 30 day challenge. So it's one exercise per day for 30 days. And I made it because this is the question I get most often. And I just got on Instagram like five minutes before I started the stream. Um, he says, hello, his name's King. I see a lot of your videos on YouTube. <laughs> Can you help me to be a digital nomad? I am a photographer and a filmmaker. I just want to travel the world. And I said, sure, I can help you. And he said, I just don't know where to start and how. So that's the most common question I get. And I used to say, okay. And I would go into like a lot of different things and help them answer it. But now I just said, you should join the next Digital Nomad Challenge because I've spent the past few months putting together just the most important things that you need to know to be able to become a digital nomad. And the whole first week, we spent completely on mindset, a whole week. And obviously we can't go through all of that in one live stream in a couple minutes, but I just wanted to talk about how important that is and how if you make just a really small mindset shift, you can change everything. So when I look back at those photos, or if you see the picture of me on the palm tree or with my old Hewlett Packard PC computer, in the year 2000, I had no idea that I would be able to travel so much. The, the biggest extent of my imagination was going on a surf trip or going on vacation. I didn't know at that moment that it was possible to live in other countries. It wasn't yet technologically possible to do your work completely online. I obviously didn't have a laptop yet. I don't know if I even had a MySpace account yet. So things have changed since then, but there's something that is permeating global culture that is holding millions of people back from becoming a digital nomad. And that is the societal collective mindset that there is a specific way to live. Like just the idea and the concept that there is one optimal way to live that everybody should strive for is bullshit <laughs> because it's just not true. And everybody buys into that and they say like, I want to travel more, but first I have to have enough in my retirement account, get this promotion, wait until my kids are older. Like there's all of these like buts. And if you just push that away for a minute and envision like, what if today, like what if I just did whatever I wanted, what if I was wherever I wanted to be? What if I was doing what I really wanna do? What would that be? What would that look like? What if I didn't care what other people thought about me? What would I do today? Or if I didn't care what other people thought, what would I work in? If I didn't care what other people thought or what my responsibilities are to like, you know, whatever the system is that you're following, whether it's, um, like societal, governmental, religious, then what would I be doing? What would I like to do? And these things we're taught are selfish. We're taught that it's selfish to want to just do what we want to do. We, we're taught that we have to always like do something for other people or follow the rules. But there's a reason why there's that metaphor about putting on your oxygen mask first. We have a lot of people in the world who want to do something that is really, really, really like way different from what they're actually doing. 
And that is causing a lot of problems, <laughs> a lot of health problems, a lot of just like problems on every level, financial problems because people aren't working in the right jobs, depression, mental health. There's like this disconnect between what people wish that they could do but are afraid to actually admit it to themselves or allow themselves to explore it and then what they think they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So if somebody would have told me when I was climbing a palm tree at 18 years old that if I wanted to in a few years, I could just live in Puerto Rico and run my business from a laptop, then gave me the steps on how to do it and how to get started, like I think I would have done it. But instead, because I was constantly fighting against like, well, I'm supposed to have like a good job because I went to college and I went to grad school and I have student loans and I'm supposed to work in my career field and I should have a, a job that has a lot of opportunity to climb the career ladder and stuff like that. And I can travel when I retire or I can travel on vacation. So I need a good job so that I have enough money to go on a good vacation. Like all of these things, this is very linear thinking. But what if that wasn't true? <laughs> what if, what if I didn't have to go to college? What if I didn't have student debt? What if I didn't go to grad school? What if I just started living the life I wanted now? But you know, then a long time ago, obviously I've done that, but that is, um, that is something that takes time to change your mindset about and it feels weird at first and i've just been reading so many of the messages and the comments from the people going through the challenge right now in our slack group and it's so it's been so enlightening for people and it's like these big hurdles that they thought they had to overcome is it's not really there it's more of like a mental construct than anything else i mean even in 2007 when i read the four hour work week and I was like, I need to marry Tim Ferriss. <laughs> He's my soulmate. I still didn't get it. Like I still thought, okay, yeah, I'm living in Costa Rica. I'm working in real estate. I'm traveling to Bali for a month. I'm going to, today is the, the Grand Prix in Monaco. I go to Monaco, go to France in the spring, like go do, go travel and do whatever. But I still thought that I had to work in a job where I had to be there physically, even though it was in a different country. And even though Tim Ferriss was writing in his book all of the ways to do it, I just didn't think that I could do it. And it wasn't for another four years, five years, that I actually completely made the transition over into like being a digital nomad with an online business. And it wasn't that I didn't have the capability or the technology to do it before. The only thing that was holding me back was my mindset that it was possible and that it was realistic for me. So if this is something that resonates with you, maybe just take a moment today and, and think about it. Like maybe do some journaling or um, just think about like, what would you do if you didn't care about the sunk costs in your life? about all of the work that you did to get to where you are now about the expectations of your parents or your teachers in third grade or your career counselor in high school or whatever it was or your boss or your colleagues or your friends like if you didn't care what anyone else thought and you didn't care about money and you're just like yeah what would i do if i was completely free and i could travel more or whatever and just see what comes out of it and also you know ask yourself like like, if I could travel more, what would I have to do? What would I have to change? Would I have to save money? Would I just have to go to Google Flights and buy a ticket and go? Like, sometimes it's something very small that we have to do, but we, like, make it seem way more complicated and difficult and expensive in our heads when it's really not. Like, one of the girls in the challenge, she wrote, I thought that digital nomads were either really rich or really poor. But now I realize that there's an in-between, <laughs> that you don't have to live on $800 a month and you don't have to be a multi-millionaire 
uh, influencer business star or something to be a digital nomad. Like she's like, I can just be myself and I can still make the amount of money that I'm accustomed to. I don't have to take a pay cut. I don't have to change my lifestyle so much. I just have to change my mindset to like, okay, I used to be an employee that went to the office every day for eight years. And now I do the same things that I'm good at. I just do it remotely for myself. And so that's something that um, has been on my mind this year or this year, this week, well, also this year. Oh, Aiden. Aiden's the one who gave me the idea to give the book away. Aiden, did you leave a review? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Giselle, do you know Giselle? Giselle went to Nomad Summit. She won the book. Yes, she followed the directions. <laughs> While it's asking, okay, let's go move to some Q&A before we run out of time. Um, Walt says, are the costs of living in Lisbon still what you say they were in your video? So the Lisbon video that I made is my most watched video on YouTube. And it's like the most controversial video that I've ever made. So I talked about how the cost, I think the costs of living are still the same as my video. Maybe the rent prices have gone up a little bit. But what I said was that you could find a room to rent from a couple hundred euro per month, or you could rent an apartment in the center for like 4,000 euro per month or more easily. Like the range is huge in Lisbon. It's like in the same neighborhood, like there's so much variation in prices. And, and depending, really, it's not even the location. I mean, obviously in the center, it's more expensive than the outskirts, but the main factor in Lisbon is if you're there long-term or short-term and what time of year you're going. If you're there during peak tourist season, if you're there during like a low season and everybody harped on like, you can't get a room for like a couple hundred euro per month anymore, even though a year ago, that's what I found when I was looking online. But everybody ignored the like 4,000 euro per month part. <laughs> so it's obviously a range. And I think as far as the food and everything, it's still quite affordable in Lisbon. But the two things that like Lisbon and Amsterdam have in common are, are really like the cost of rent. Or that is the, the thing that makes these two cities have a lot in common. So in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands in general, the cost of living is quite low when you don't account for rent. But for some reason, for especially for digital nomads in short term, the rent prices can be astronomically high if you're there for a short period of time. So I haven't looked for housing in Lisbon in the last couple months because I'm not there right now. But um, if you want to go out of like the main area, and go maybe like across the water or just a little bit outside, you can get a lot cheaper housing. And it's the same thing with Amsterdam. If you get out of the center rings in the main neighborhoods and you're still within like, let's say 30 minutes on the on public transportation to get into the center, you can like cut your cost of rent in half. Or if you go outside of the city altogether, like if you just go to a smaller town in Portugal or if you go to like a smaller town in, in Holland, you can like pay a fraction of the price in rent. But what has happened in places like Lisbon and Amsterdam is that there's so much tourism and um, the high season has started to like grow to become year round. So there's this upward pressure on rent prices in the most high demand areas in the city center. And so there's less long-term housing for locals and the short-term housing that is available is priced in the highest price point directed at short-term tourism. So that is the issue there. But, um, and Krista said she thinks living in Lisbon is expensive, but I think if you get a good housing situation where you're not paying too much for rent and it's going to take some time, but otherwise like the prices of the food 
at like the grocery stores and the markets is not that high. I don't think it's much higher than other other parts of um of Europe. <laughs> yeah, I was hugging a tree. Hi Chandra. Alex, why are you so negative in the chat today? I don't I don't agree. I don't agree that um that Americans like hate anything or any people and specifically. I think that all people around the world are are the same. We're all part of the human race, but we have many cultural differences and we have many unique personality traits and things that make all of us different, but we're all part of humanity. Everybody has the same Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We all need shelter. We all need food. We all need community. We all need love. We all need to express ourselves. We all need to work or feel a sense of purpose. Like we all have these same needs. Aiden says mind over matter. Many of like the jobs we have today did not exist 15 years ago. That's true. I feel like my life has been really weird. I don't know if you guys relate that I feel like I was too far ahead of myself in technology when I was trying to do what I didn't know I was doing. <laughs> but now sometimes I feel like, did I miss the peak of things when like Tim Ferriss and everybody were like having their, their businesses with their virtual assistants and stuff? But no, I don't think so. I think it's still very new. I think that the like Tim Ferriss lifestyle design crew were part of like the very early adopters, but that the, the collective mindset of the world in general is still nine to five commute, work in person, stop working when you retire. And like, we need to flip that around the matrix. Yeah. Value your opinion towards yourself more than what other people think. Yep, easier said than done, but agree. It's something that uh, one of my friends posted on Instagram that she has to find a way to like love herself every single day. And it's kind of true. I mean, we get the clean slate every day. Every morning when we wake up, we get to start over if we wake up. So that can be difficult too as you get older because it feels like a lot of baggage is like coming with you. Like you might wake up thinking about what happened yesterday or what happened last month or what's going to happen next week. And so we just need to come back to, th to the present and remember that usually we're, we're safe in the moment. Things that we're going, that we're worrying about are probably not going to happen. And there's no difference if you're just like sitting somewhere at the park or in your house and you have food and you have water, you have, um, you have your technology, you have like all of your basic needs. So whether you have like, like a hundred dollars in the bank or a million dollars in the bank in that moment, you're okay. So it's just reminding yourself and just keep going one step in front of the other when things get tough. <laughs> no, I don't actually, I don't actually want to marry Tim Ferriss anymore. That's what I thought 12 years ago, I guess. I mean, you can imagine, I don't know how old I was, bad at math, bad at Japanese, but that was the first time I had ever seen a book about that. And I already was having the same problems I have today, like with dating. So living in Costa Rica as like a 21 year old. Now I started living there when I was 19. So I spent my entire decade of my twenties abroad. And so it, like dating was so, it's been difficult the whole time. So I see this like cute guy who's my same age 
Tim Ferriss, who's writing this book, with everything that is in the book, I agree with. And I was like, oh my God, this guy is my soulmate. But you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think that anymore. But he's still really cool. Hi, Surya. Yes, we did talk on the phone yesterday. So Surya is in Bali and he wants to move to another country to continue his work. He already works online, but he also has a day job. So for a lot of different reasons, which I won't disclose for client confidentiality, he wants to move to a different country. And so we talked about that yesterday on the phone. Thanks for coming and hanging out in the stream. I'm confused what Alex, I'm Alex, what is your point? I'm very confused. The US definitely has a culture. Every country has a culture, for sure. And Aiden says some career counselors are scam artists. True story, my career counselor, in college, which I write about in the book, told me my idea was crazy to like work in different countries and work from my laptop, which by this time was like 2000. I don't know, it must've been 2000 because I had gone to Italy for my senior trip and I had this idea that I would just live in Italy and work there. And he's like, that's not a job, that's a vacation. And I was like, no, I think I can do it. I was tr explaining that. Anyway, he didn't believe me. And then my career counselor when I was in business school, you know, if you go to grad school, like especially business school, they're supposed to be a really good career center to help place you in a job. That's like part of the package that you sign up for when you get an MBA. And my career counselor or hours of our class quit in the first semester. And the school never hired someone else. So shame on UCF for like just letting us all fend for ourselves. Whereas if we went to like an Ivy League school or a better school, then they would have had a lot more advisory services for us and job placement opportunities. But because of that, I ended up going to Costa Rica because the jobs that I was finding for myself in Orlando were not impressive and they weren't fun and they didn't pay well. So because my career counselor quit when I was in business school, that is one of the things that contributed to me eventually becoming a digital nomad. So you never know how things are gonna play out. Agree, Aiden, the nine to five is gonna become a dinosaur soon. I think some people will still obviously need to work in a workplace. Um, some people will be at a disadvantage though if they aren't able to work remotely, if they don't have the skill set for that because their um, the number of jobs that they can have is going to be reduced compared to today. So there will become eventually a tipping point where there's less job opportunities for non-remote workers. Hi Rupesh. Aiden wakes up and spends the first 10 minutes of the day to be thankful. Uh, I do too. And if you guys remember from Nomad Summit, I talked about the app called Workflowy, where every day, well, you can log whatever stuff. Workflowy is an app that is supposed to be your brain in app form. So it's designed in a way that it's like a brain fart kind of. <laughs> Um, it's an amazing app. I use it so much. I use it for personal. I use it for business. I use it for ideas. I use it for research. I use it for structuring my book, structuring blogs. I used it for creating the Digital Nomad Challenge to organize my thoughts and move things around. And I use it for my daily gratitude practice. So every day I put a new bullet in for that day and I type out what I'm grateful for when I'm still in bed. And then I put my phone away because you shouldn't look at your phone in the morning. Thank you, Rupesh. <laughs> Walt, yeah, Walt's better at math than me. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I've I've blocked some people on YouTube for sure. It's just if people, um, it's not really so much in the live streams, but in the in the comments of videos, like people get really uh, crazy sometimes. Actually, that's an interesting human human psychology study because I think it's really hard for people to say bad things to your face or even in the live streams as much because there's accountability. But when you're just leaving a comment on something on Twitter or on a YouTube video, people feel like they get to be more anonymous and they can hide behind that. So I get more out of line comments there. So some people I've banned from both channels actually. And yeah. But it's like if somebody were to call you every day, every five minutes, and just like for no reason. People who just like leave lots of comments or bad comments or weird comments every day for no reason. Like once in a while, I'll just delete the comment. But if it's like consistent, you're just going to get blocked. There's plenty of other people that they can go bother. Hi, MD, can you um, clarify the question? Well, I, I think that uh, American culture in depth, I mean, there definitely, there's an actual culture of the country and then there's also stereotypes and there's a range of positive and negative qualities about each country. So. Some countries get hate for being like too laid back or too poor or too corrupt or whatever. We have like, we're human. So we have a scale to rank everything. We have who's the best in math. We have who has the best crime rate, who has the worst crime rate. Like we're all like human beings are just trying to measure things and figure out what's going on. And that applies as well with culture. So there are traits of the US culture that uh, people want to in, uh, emphasize, and then there's also things that we want to minimize. So, um, of course, the U.S. is associated with a country that is a democracy that promotes freedom. Um, these are some of the positive traits. Um, we also are very innovative as a culture, very diverse, very inclusive, hopefully. <laughs> but then there are also some things like the U.S. can be criticized for being um, like too dominant of a presence, um, maybe too too much, uh, too trying to influence other countries too much, being too consumeristic. Um, working hard could be viewed in a positive way as a, we're a culture that likes to work. We attract a lot of immigrants who are coming to work. We have the American dream. But then also that it's a double edged sword because we're also known for working too hard and the rat race and commuting and things like that. So, but I think that the American culture is a lot about food, uh, community, entertainment, um, having fun. It's like a work hard, play hard kind of culture in a way, but it just depends on where you are. I mean, every state, every town, like if you look at Florida, you have a different culture in Miami, you have a different culture on the west coast of the state, you have a different culture in central Florida, you have a different culture in the tiny towns that are um, peppered throughout the entire state. You have a different culture of north Florida versus the panhandle versus the beaches, you know, it's all different. So that's what's so um, characteristic of America is its diversity. Oh, so these photos behind me are my brother's photos. So if you want to check out his work, these are very old photos. But um, so it was his birthday yesterday, and that's why I was looking at old photos, trying to go uh, find something cool to post on Facebook for him. 
but these actually Puerto Rico, these are Puerto Rico. I think all these photos are from Puerto Rico, but he was the photo editor of multiple surf magazines, of Surfing Magazine, of Eastern Surf Magazine, of Transworld Surf Magazine. He's also a contributing writer and photographer to other surf magazines around the world. And now he works full time for Vans, so for the shoe company. And if you want to look at his work, you can uh, Google Jim McCain. So it's like Hurricane and Jimmy mixed together. J I M M I C A N E. And it's because he's like a hurricane. <laughs> he has so much energy and he just kind of whips through and does crazy stuff. But he's also Jimmy and he's an amazing photographer and videographer. And yeah, his Instagram is like beautiful. So he lives in California. So these are his videos or his uh, photos. Walt says that the closer he gets to going nomad, the more anxiety he experiences. So with mindset, what are the, the legit concerns and what are the things that people are overreacting about? And when it comes to actually, if you already like are a nomad or you are becoming a nomad, there's a lot more legit concerns. But I think the the ones that hold people back at the beginning are more general. Like they could be valid concerns like money, for example, but they could also be that they don't have enough of something. They don't have enough experience. They don't have enough money. They don't have enough time. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to start. And so this just goes around and around in circles for like years and people don't take action because it's overwhelming. It's a lot to think about going against the grain in society, taking a different path, um, doing something that nobody understands or that your friends and close, uh, close friends and close family don't understand, um, doing something that your coworkers aren't doing, that your supervisor says you can't do, like everyone's saying you can't do it or that it's risky or dangerous or that you're gonna throw away everything you've worked for or throw away your future or make less money or there's so many different fears that get thrown at you. So I think those are, they're not necessarily over the top, like they're legit concerns, but when people get bombarded with that, it makes them less likely to, to actually make that switch. So once you are ready to do it, you need to think about, uh, it's really financial I would say is the biggest thing and just making sure that you have money coming in, that you have proven revenue streams, that you have a business plan and that you're not just like going out to search for ideas unless you have like a unlimited income or savings to to support that. So of course there are exceptions. There are people who took a small amount of money and a one way ticket to Chiang Mai to try to meet with other people who can help them. But there's so much more that you can do before you leave without putting yourself in a really a pressurized situation unless you thrive on that pressure. Thanks, Surya and Aiden. Yes, a couple more weeks. I leave June 15th for Paris. So that's very exciting. And then I have officially booked the following week in uh, Vilnius, Lithuania with Johnny FD and Sam Marks. So they have Travel Like a Boss podcast and Invest Like a Boss podcast. And Johnny is one of my favorite travel buddies. We uh, traveled to, we went on the Nomad Cruise. That's where we met. We met in Spain. We went to Greece and like hung out with a bunch of other nomads. And then we went to Bulgaria together and um, went to the co-working space and co-working dance go. And I was on his podcast, Travel Like a Boss. And then he was just recently on Badass Digital Nomads because he's one of the OG <laughs> Badass Digital Nomads. He travels more than probably anyone I know, but he's able to handle it. So good for him. So I was going to be... Um, going between Paris and Norway at the same time that he posted on Facebook that he was going to Vilnius. And that's been on my list of places to go for years. Uh, I wanted to go when I was in Estonia, but I ran out of time. Um, 
So I took the advantage, took advantage of doing that and I'm going to go there for a week. So that's exciting too. And then I'm not sure about Norway. I might push it back a little bit instead of going in July, but we'll see when it gets closer. Yeah, there's definitely a stereotype of Americans pretending to be Canadians so that they don't get judged when they are traveling internationally, but I don't think that's necessary. I mean, yeah, Canadians have a less, um, I, I would say, there's like less of an emotional trigger there when you say you're Canadian versus um, Americans. Like um, American America is just more of a polarized concept and nation compared to Canada. Like Canadians are known for being the nice people who are like chill, laid back. They have their stuff under control, and it's like they're not really making the news every day, <laughs> whereas America is. So people have like more opinions about America and Americans than Canadians. And yes, America has some bad habits. We have um, a lot of like a high obesity rate. We have high heart disease. We have high cancer. We have a lot of like health problems and systemic problems. We have a lot of fast food. You know, we have a lot of things like that. So, and then we also have Donald Trump, who's like a very polarizing figure to be leading the country. You either love him or hate him. So I, I do think though that being an American and, and going abroad gives you the opportunity to engage with people in, in cool discussions and to see what, they, what their impression is of the country. And if it's a negative one to maybe not try to intentionally change it, but to just offer a new perspective. And a lot of people are, or were surprised when I first started traveling, like they were like, well, I thought Americans didn't travel or, you know, there's like all these stereotypes about Americans. So hopefully my behavior and my relationships and friendships with people over the years has given them a more positive per, um, outlook on how Americans can act in the world and that all of us aren't the way that we're portrayed stereotypically in the media. So if you are American, just own it. But yeah, I mean, I've, it's like if you believe something, you're going to see anecdotal evidence of it. So if you have a very strong opinion that all Americans are assholes, every time you meet an American that's an asshole, that's going to reinforce your opinion. And that is, uh, there's a psychological term for it that I'm drawing a blank right now. But it's like a, a proven concept in psychology where you, uh, shoot, what is it? <laughs> it's like where you observe something and then you uh, reinforce your opinions. Selective perception, maybe? I'm not sure. No, oh, Aiden says, happy birthday, Jimmy. Hello, Adnan. Thank you. It's nice to see you too. You're welcome, Alex. Alex always coming through with the deep questions. Love it. True. We always will regret the things that we didn't do rather than the things we did do. How many times do we need to hear that as human beings? I mean, there's books on it. It's like everybody knows that when you're the cliche 100 years old or 90 years old on your deathbed, you're never going to think like, I wish I didn't go skydiving in Africa or whatever your like bucket list thing is. You'll just be like, yeah, I wish I did it. I mean, look at um, the yes theory. Love those guys. They had a, uh, what, what the heck? <laughs> what is his name? Will Smith. Hello. Will Smith on their show. Uh, sky, was it skydiving or bunge, bungee jumping into the Grand Canyon? I mean, the things that you that scare you the most are the things that you should do. And this is a concept that's very prevalent throughout Stoicism and that author Ryan Holiday wrote, writes about and the obstacle is the way. It's like the obstacle is the way. Whatever you are afraid to do, you should do. Or you should at least explore. I'm not giving personal life advice. Like 
telling thousands of people to do something that I don't know what it is. But <laughs> if there's something on your mind, you should explore it and consider why you're really afraid of it. And maybe you could overcome that fear. That's why there are shows like The Fear Factor and stuff. Yes. Sam and Johnny on Badass Digital Nomads. Oh, I haven't asked them if they want to do it, but that's a good idea. I should do um, a group Badass Digital Nomads episode with Sam and Johnny. I'll see how much time we have and if they want to do it. I don't see why not. True that, Tech Lords. Confirmation bias. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> yes. That works both ways. I think that is kind of the secret to the secret, you know, with manifesting things. Sometimes it's completely random coincidence. Like, not, sorry, somebody yesterday, okay, one of my clients from India wants to move to Europe. So I was brainstorming countries that he could go to that fit his needs, his budget, his goals and objectives. And one of the countries was Bulgaria for a few specific reasons. And as I was sending him links about Bulgaria, somebody, um, I had just messaged somebody on Facebook. So I had Facebook open and it was also regarding Bulgaria. And then, so I was messaging someone about Facebook. I was sending an email, or sorry, I was mess messaging someone on Facebook about Bulgaria. I was sending an email about Bulgaria to my client. And at the same time, my yoga teacher in Bulgaria tagged me in a post that was like one year ago today doing yoga in Bulgaria. And he's Indian and my client is Indian. And I was like, that's weird. And I haven't thought of that guy or like talked to him in a year. And so in the same 60 seconds, all of that stuff happened. And so that's kind of like <laughs> with the secret and manifesting stuff or when it comes to psychology and confirmation bias and selective perception, it's like sometimes the things that you're working on or you're doing or you're thinking about start to show up in your real life and it's just a little bit weird. But it's not. It's normal. Yeah, Tech Lords, have you seen the um, – interview with Vlad Glebov about being a citizen of the world because Tech Lord says it's strange to like belong and pledge allegiance to a flag because we're all humans so we talk about that a lot in the um in that let me find it um it is cool in a way to have you know feel like you're on the same team with other people who are from the same country it just gives you like a, a sense of camaraderie which we see of course during uh the olympics for example so i'll post this link in here if you guys want to check out that video because we go deep into that topic but also pledging allegiance geo geopolitically to like a different country and a different flag pits us against each other. And this is why we have wars. And this is why we have uh, these competitive uh, trade strategies and like geopolitical fighting. I mean, it's all a way to come together, but also it divides the whole planet. So especially looking at um, the like the like the the health of the planet the climate you know we have countries that are looking in their best interests because they want to grow industrially and then we also have countries that are completely green and they've already been through their industrial revolution and they found other ways to to grow economically and to compete so you have these like competing personal or special interests that can drown out the collective best case scenario for the planet. And that is where things get tricky. So I do like, I don't really believe in like the secret or whatever, the way that it was presented, but 
I definitely think that our brain functions in a way that when we are asking the right questions, we can get the answer. So it's like when the student is ready, the teacher appears. If we're looking for something, seek and you shall find. So if you're just not doing anything, then you're not going to notice many synchronicities or clues or answers in your environment. But when you're when you're really looking for something, and for me with my journaling routine and my meditation and everything, it's like the answers almost come too quickly. <laughs> And I don't know if they're coming from somewhere embedded in my brain or if it's a combination of external stimuli and like environmental triggers mixing with what I'm thinking about that particular day or a, a problem, a research problem that I'm trying to solve. Or it's like even when I watch a video, I like to watch one of my videos before bed that I'm editing. And then in the morning, I have an idea of how to fix a problem that's in the, the video. And I'm sure you guys have had that too with work, with school you sleep on it and things happen and things come together and they get clear. So I, that's more the way that I think that it works. I haven't studied psychology except for in, I think my freshman year of college. I think we took like psychology 101. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So yes, one of the things we talk about in the challenge is what types of people are holding us back from traveling or becoming digital nomads. So it's not just a mindset, but it's also, yeah, our, our environmental conditions, conditioning and conditions, actually. Um, okay, so I'll see you guys tomorrow for either part two of the Kyoto vlog or part two of the Estonia vlog. And I will also see you on Tuesday at 12 p.m. for the live podcast interview with Dave from Nomad X. So any of you with burning questions about the cost of living in Lisbon or where to find housing in Lisbon, we're going to get another uh, opinion from Dave. <laughs> so make sure to come for that. And um, yeah, we'll see you next Sunday. Happy Memorial Day. As a digital nomad, I basically don't observe any holidays because every day is the same for me. It doesn't matter if it's Monday or Friday, but I'm just going to be here. So no changes on our side, but I hope you have a great uh, day off if you do, if you're in the U.S. And otherwise, if you are um, wherever you are in the world, just have a great weekend. Thanks again for the reviews and subs on Badass Digital Nomads on Google Play, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for spreading the love and share it with somebody who you think needs to hear any of those episodes.